All right, let's begin. So uh, hopefully you guys had a chance to go through the review online and your final, if you're in the RO3 section, is tomorrow at 9.30. So um, just some to, to recap some of the important uh, time, uh, time intervals here. So the final officially starts at 9.30 a.m., but it will be open as of 9.15 a.m., just in case um, it takes you a while to log in. So uh, if you can log in very quickly, um, that's like me giving you an extra 15 minutes. So um, I guess that's nice. But otherwise, if you start at 9.30, technically you will have enough time to finish the final. The final lasts two hours and 15 minutes. So it will officially be from 9.30 to uh, 11.45. And then after that, you have another 15 minutes to scan everything and send it in. So by noon, you should be out, noon or before. Um, so with uh, these extra buffers I'm giving you, technically the, the final is gonna last half an hour longer than it would under normal circumstances. So you could even be out by 11.30 or earlier if you are moving on pace. Uh, that being said, uh, hopefully you guys actually saw the mock final. And I will, I'm here now to, I guess, answer questions, anything that you might have concerns, questions, that sort of thing. Um, can you go over what you meant, like in the mock final, it was about like the exponential decay. Can you go over what you meant by um, initial condition? Oh, okay. So initial condition is just an equation that tells you uh, the starting point, hold on, so hopefully you can see that. So we have a different theme here because um, I've been spending so much time on the computer lately. Uh, it's easier in my eyes if I go with a darker theme, so hopefully you guys don't mind this. Um, so when it comes to initial conditions, uh, This just refers to an initial point. So uh, for example, if we say P of T equals the amount at time T, and then I say we start at, we start with say 10 grams, then the initial condition would be the statement uh, p of zero equals 10. So that's literally saying when time is zero, uh, we start with 10. And, and, and that's it, just that little equation there. So if you have the uh, differential equation, you might remember, so the differential, so if I ask you about differential equation, with initial condition, then that's you writing down the statement, uh, P prime equals, if this is say decay, minus RP comma, then you'd write P of zero equals 10. And of course, you would need to fill in this R value. So uh, that's it. Initial condition is just that one little equation right here that basically tells you at the start we have this, but you write it in this form. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so when they say, so if the statement said part A of that question, I believe said something like, uh, write down a differential equation with initial condition to describe the situation. You're literally going to write down this. If it's decay, there's a minus sign here. If there's not, if it's growth, it's positive. 
And then you write down this part here, that's your initial condition. So uh, your differential equation is this part and your initial condition is this part. Okay, um, other questions? For the formula for the differential equation, um, do you plug in anything for P or do you just plug no. in R? No, so P prime and P stay as is. You literally just plug in the R. So the only time you'd plug in anything for P, that is in a specific situation if they asked you something like, what is the rate of growth when there are, there's 10 grams remaining? Then you plug in P equals 10 and the R, and then you'd say, oh, the rate of growth is this. But for the differential equation, the P's are stay, they, they are left as variables. The R is the only thing you need to fill this. Okay, other questions? Could you briefly go over implicit differentiation? Okay, so implicit differentiation, duh, duh, duh. so there are two situations where you would need to know implicit differentiation. Uh, so implicit differentiation. So to not go over the whole lecture and just kind of focus on what we would need. Um, so there, there are two situations you would need this. So one situation is I'm going to ask you find uh, dy dx for some equation f of x, y equals constant. So this is like uh, an example of this. Oh, that's pretty thick. An example of this would be like when x's and y's are mixed together. So like x squared y cubed plus 7xy equals 4x or something like that. And I ask you to find uh, what is y prime or dy dx. And the idea here is you just differentiate as normal. But when differentiating a say a y term, anything with a y in it, um, multiply by, by y prime. That's it. So, I mean, to go with this example here, and differentiate as usual means you have to obey all derivative rules as before. So, differentiate as usual would mean that, for example, in the first situation, I have a product of functions. So, that means I should be doing the product rule. So I'm going to differentiate the x term, leave the y term alone, plus leave the x term, differentiate the y term. But according to the rule that I just gave you, every time you differentiate a y term, multiply by dy dx or y prime. So I'm just gonna multiply this by y prime because I just differentiated the y term. Similarly, moving on to the next one, um, differentiate this, x times y, that is again a product of functions. So I differentiate the x, leave the y, plus leave the x, differentiate the y but then I multiply by y prime. On the other side, derivative of 4x is four. And now all you do is you wanna solve for these guys. So then basically that means you are just going to go and use algebra. So everything that doesn't have those guys, move them to the other side, so on the other side, on the other side, you would have four minus two xy cubed. That gets rid of this guy. Uh, 
minus 7y, that gets rid of that guy. And then on the other side, you have these two people where they have a common term of y prime. So this is 3x squared y squared, gets rid of that guy. And then plus 7x, gets rid of that guy. And then you just uh, solve for y prime by dividing. So that's one situation in which you'll need to know uh, implicit differentiation. So it's when um, your independent and dependent variables are mixed together in an equation, but you still want to find the derivative of the, um, of the dependent variable. Um, so that's one situation. Uh, the other situation would come from uh, related rates. So this is when here time, which we'll usually denote by T, is the independent variable. So this means um, whenever you're differentiating anything that's not a T, you must multiply by the derivative of the variable. So uh, I guess an example here would be, I don't know, you have a, a 15 foot ladder lying against the wall. Uh, let X be its distance from the wall, Y be this. And let's say the foot of the ladder is being pulled away from the wall at say two feet per second. And then the question is, uh, how fast is the ladder sliding down the wall? Right, which at this point you should recognize that as asking what is dy dt. Um, but the, the problem won't probably state it that way. It'll say, how fast is the ladder sliding down the wall? And that's, that's you trying to figure out, well, how fast is this moving down here if I know that is going across there? So um, by going through our steps, you'll eventually get to the point where you get to an equation, and I believe in related rates, that was step four, where you'd have x squared plus y squared equals 15 squared. And then in step five, you'd have to differentiate. So now the idea is because you're in a related rates problem, you know that time is always the independent variable, which means your x and your, t, your, x and your y are, you can think of there being inside functions. So when you differentiate the x to x, you have to multiply by the x prime, which is dx dt. Plus, when you differentiate the y, you get 2y. You have to multiply by the y prime, dy dt. Every time you differentiate something that's not a t, you have to multiply by its prime. Now, 15 squared, you differentiate that, you get uh, 0. So this step here is implicit differentiation. I have a question. Um, and then, and then you actually continue to answer the question after that. Yeah? Um, there was a problem. I'm pretty sure it was like, exactly the same as that was on the our exam uh last week but so when you're finding for like step four when you're finding the equation yeah i think in the problem it said like the height was like nine feet or something for like variable y yeah. so for step four like how do you know if you should put in 15 square for like the end or like you put in nine squared because obviously if you put in both then right because following the steps that I gave you guys, you'd realize that plugging in numbers does not come until step six. So that's how you know. You're in step four. So you know not to plug anything in because the step where you plug in is actually step six. 
So remember when you're doing related rates, the process was one, read the problem, two, draw a diagram and label it properly, three, write on what you know and what you want to find, four, set up the equation, five, differentiate the equation and solve for the rate that you want, and six, plug in the specific numbers. So you do not get to the point where you plug in the nine at step four. It's just not something you would do because it's not in the steps. So at that point, there, there should be no confusion here as to do I need to plug this in? Now there's one situation, and we covered this in class, where you might get to step six and you need to actually plug in some values to figure something out, but you realize that you have too many unknowns. And in that situation, you would go back to step four, plug in the number, solve for the unknown that you need, and then go back to step six. But at the end of the day, you still do not start plugging in anything at all until step six. So that's how you, so if they tell you, oh, how fast is the ladder sliding down the wall when X is, and, and yes, they'll, they'll usually give you another thing here that says something like, when it is nine feet from the wall. Right? So that nine feet, you do not mess with that nine until step six of the related rates problem. You ignore it until step six. So that's how you would know. Hopefully that answers, question, answers your question. Oh, thank you. Okay. So everything stays pretty general, as general as possible, um, until step six. So any numbers that show up, like the number that showed up here, the 15 squared, the only reason that 15 is there is because I set up the diagram with that 15. And I, and I also mentioned to you guys how you would put constants in the diagram. So in general, you want to keep things very general. Everything is a variable unless things that you know for sure are not changing. And so, um, so the person who would write a Z here, for example, they might need to plug in the 15 in step four in order to get things to make sense. But that just makes it more confusing to me. Just set up the diagram the right way in the first place and then just worry about plugging in stuff at step six. You, you won't have to worry about it before that. So pretty much once you set up your diagram, all everything up to step five is based on that diagram. It's not, it's not you plugging in specific values. Okay, other questions? Um, how would you differentiate ln of x to the x power? ln of x to the x power? Yeah. Meaning, well, it depends on what you mean. So um, you, using if, you, if you have example, ln of x to the x versus ln of x to the x, uh, which one do you mean? Because they're both the second, dealt with the different. Second one. The second one, and there's an X up here. So you would use the rule, uh, you would use log differentiation. So for this, I would use log differentiation. Yeah, I tried doing that, but I... So if your Y equals LN of X to the X, then what I would do is I would log both sides, LN of Y equals LN of LN of X to the X. That would allow me to move this X down in front. Mm -hmm. So then that would be X LN of LN of X. Then I would differentiate both sides. So this is Y prime over Y. And this part is the product rule because I have two functions yeah. here, X and I have this. So for this, you would need the chain rule. Okay, yeah, that's where, that. but yeah, I was getting confused there. So, um, so you would differentiate the X, one, leave the LN part, plus you leave the X, you differentiate the LN part. Now, the derivative of LN is one over the thing times the derivative of the thing. 
So that would be that. Um, you'll notice that your X's would cancel. And so you would have LN of LN X plus one over LN X. And so then your Y prime would equal to Y times um, pretty much this whole thing right here. Which then you would say uh, y prime equals, you rewrite the original function. So it's ln of x to the x times um, that guy. And that that would that would be your answer for this particular problem. So um, can you redo um, the chain rule part because I'm still not sure how um, how you did it. The chain rule says the derivative of ln of anything is the derivative of the thing over the thing itself. Right. So now if I uh, have the derivative of ln of ln then it's going to be the derivative of ln over ln. Oh. And the derivative of ln is one over x. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, uh, that's this part right here. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. And the other one, by the way, if you had y equals this, that one is actually a lot easier because then I would just move the x down and then just differentiate using the product rule. So it's one times ln x plus x times one over x. So the derivative here is just ln of x plus one. So they're very, they're very different. Right. So there is, a, there is a thing whenever it's written like this, um, it really means that only the, th the thing being ln has a power versus the entire ln has a power. Those are two very different situations. And hopefully that answers your question. Um, Other questions? What would be the best way to differentiate um, something if you had some function divided by another function and that's all within an ln? Would you use um, log rules? To log rules first, them? yes. Okay. So, um, so uh, if, you, if you're differentiating, and this is just a general rule, if you're differentiating uh, say y equals ln of some function, then I would say always try to apply the log rules first. It can make it so much nicer. So if you have like a y equals ln of, uh, you know, the square root of x e to the x over no x minus one cubed and all of that is in an ln. Now to actually differentiate the inside here, if you if you apply this rule directly that I mentioned over here, u prime over u, uh, to get the u prime is going to be really annoying. It's going to be an annoying mess. You're, even if you switch it to product rule, if you want, um, it's still going to be annoying. So what I would do is first simplify. So this is ln of the radical of x e to the x minus ln of x minus one cubed. And so this would be half ln x plus a half ln of e to the x minus three ln of x minus one. And so this you know is actually x. So this is actually one half ln x plus a half x minus three ln of x minus one. Um, and so you can uh, much easily the easier, uh, find the derivative of that. So this is one over two X plus a half minus three over X minus one. So I'd, I'd pretty much say, yeah, always, 
always kind of do that. Because one of the whole, the whole reason that we even decided to go with the LN notation is because it made computations easier on the algebraic level. So, so yeah, I, I'd always use the LN, LN rules if at all possible. And I'd probably take that as a general cue also, by the way. So if you see a problem, if you see something that you can do with algebra or pre-calc knowledge to simplify the problem before moving on to calculus, I, I will pretty much always recommend that you do that. So um, knowing how to simplify a logarithm is a, is a pre-calculus thing. So I'd probably go with the pre-calculus step before the calculus step. Okay, other questions? Um, one of the related rates problems in the handout is it asks for the instantaneous rate of change of the area of yes. the circle. I think it's number six. Could you go over how to do that, please? So first of all, do you know what instantaneous rate of change means? Like that phrase? Um, is it the derivative or? Yeah, it's just another way of saying derivative. Okay. So, um, so it's, that's like them asking for a prime. And, and you're talking about in the handouts from a class? Yeah, it's number six. It's like the radius of a circle is increasing. Okay, hold on. Let me see. Going to the website here, related rates, and out. Okay, scroll down, problem six. So that guy. Uh, from related rates handout. Okay, so, um, all right, so we know it's a related rates problem. So step one be to read, step two, diagram. So it's just a circle. And its radius is increasing. So this I would label R because R is moving. And it also mentions area. You can't really see the area here. So I'll just write down area. We should know that's pi R squared. Okay, so that's my diagram. A and R are my variables. Three, write down what I know what I want. So um, the radius is increasing at a rate of one. So I know my dr dt equals one. What is the rate instantaneous rate of change of area of the circle the instant that? So this is asking for da dt. When area is four pi, when a equals four pi. So now I move down to four, I'm gonna set up the equation. Uh, and so, yeah, we already know that A equals pi R squared. So now five, I'm going to differentiate implicitly. 
with respect to T. And so this is DA DT equals uh, 2 pi R dr dt. And so now we go to step six. And remember, this is where I start plugging stuff in. So uh, da dt, I don't know, I want that. So this is two pi. Now, do we know what R is? So you'll notice here, um, we don't know what R is. Uh, but our dr dt, we do know what that is. This was one. So what does it mean when we don't know R? This is where you go back to step four. Um, and that gives you this equation, a equals pi r squared. Now, what do we know in that equation? Well, we know what the a is. The a is four pi. So I would just plug that in, four pi. Boom, boom, you'd get your r equals two. And so now you go back and you plug that in. So, um, and that's it. Uh, so the arrow four pi, like a meter squared per second. But uh, that's it. So any questions on that? Like where were you getting stuck with this one? Um, I just didn't know, I forgot that we need to like go back to the equation. Yes, like, so that, that is written in the handout on step six. So it, it says if you're in, like this is on the original handout in the, in the boxes. So if you're in step six and you don't have all the information, the instruction is to go back to step four. So that's in the handout, it's, it's one of the steps. So you, you wanna be able to tackle these related rates problems, just know the procedure and it, it I wrote out all the things that could go wrong and how to deal with them in the, in the steps. So you see, I just, I just went through the steps here. One, two, three, four, five, six. By the time you get to step six, everything should be solved. If not, uh, the, the step says go back to step four. Anything that's missing, we should be able to figure it out from around there. Um, do you mind going over problem 1E on the mock final? It was the implicit differentiation derivative problem. Uh, so I think you came in after we spoke about implicit differentiation. So, uh, so the two situations you need for this one is for like problem 1E that you're talking about. When we give you an equation where X's and Y's are mixed together. Uh, the thing to do here is to differentiate as usual, but when differentiating a y term, multiply by y prime. So here we go through, we differentiate this term by term. The first term needs the product rule, so I do the product rule. And the difference is, so differentiate by x, leave the y plus, leave the x, differentiate the y term, when I multiply, and then I multiply by y prime. So we kind of went over that discussion before you came in. Um, but I guess if I can pull up the problem that you're talking about, um, which is very similar to the example I just did. So, well, I did earlier. So. So this is uh, from mock final.
And hopefully if you're here, you've already taken the mock final. It, uh, it won't help you very much if you come here before taking it. Um, it's, it will be a much better use of your time to leave, go take the mock final, and then come back and watch the video for this after taking it. That, that would actually be more helpful. So hopefully everyone took the mock final already. Um, so yeah, so for this, you would just go through and you can differentiate term by term. So for the x, y squared, you need the product rule. So I differentiate the x, leave the y squared, plus leave the x, differentiate the y squared. But because I differentiate a y term, I multiply by y prime. Plus do the same thing. x cubed, differentiate the x, leave the y, plus leave the x, differentiate the y, and then multiply by y prime. Derivative of three would be zero, derivative of two y is just two y prime. And so now you just go through and you solve for this. At, at this point, all the calculus is done. It's now just an algebra problem. So I'm going to group all the, uh, the y primes and the y. So, so over here I have a two y prime and I could minus this two x y y prime and I could minus this minus x cubed y prime. And what's left over here is the y squared, which is that guy, and plus the three x squared y, which is that guy. And so now you'll notice here, I could factor out a common y prime. So then I would get y squared plus three x squared y all over that thing, two minus two x y minus x cubed equals y prime. So it's just about knowing the strategy. Go through, differentiate as normal. You have to obey all your derivative rules. So product rule, chain rule, quotient rule, all those things still apply. The difference is whenever you differentiate a y term, multiply by y prime. And at the end, solve for all the y primes. Gather them together and get everyone else on the other side. So that is one of the two situations in which you're going to need uh, implicit differentiation. The second situation being related rates. Could so, you go over um, 2C on the mock? Uh, two part C? Yeah. Um, Two part C. Um, maybe you can tell me what you think you should do. So if you're in a similar situation, but not exactly like this, you'll kind of know what you want to do. So maybe tell me what you're thinking. I don't know, I needed a little bit of help figuring this one out. So no, no thoughts and ideas of something you would try. So we have an exponential here. Do you know any integration rules with exponentials? So that's, that's where it would start. So with differentiation and integration. Knowing the rules is a must. So if you don't know all the rules by heart, uh, you do want to definitely spend some time today and learn those. So uh, when it comes to integration, there are two rules that you should know that with regards to the exponential, the integral of e to the x is, maybe someone else can answer, what, what is that? e to the x. No. Plus c. Plus c, don't forget the plus c. Okay, so e to the x plus c. Now there's a slight variation on this and you could actually figure this out using uh, substitution 
But I think it's something that it's worth memorizing by heart because it just shows up often enough. If you have e to some constant times x, now technically you could go through and do a substitution. U equals kx, your du would be k dx, and then you divide through by k, but ultimately you end up with one over k e to the kx. Right? So whenever an exponential shows up in an integral problem, these are the two rules. So um, technically you can memorize the first one and then the second one follows by a simple substitution, but I think it's kind of worth it to memorize both of them. Um, so here we have an exponential. However, it is in the denominator. The rule I know does not have the exponential in the denominator, right? I want to apply a rule I know to doing this. So having the exponential in a denominator is a problem. So that should probably tell you what is the first thing that you'd want to actually try to get to happen. Um, so what do you guys think would be the first thing that we want to get to happen? Right? Because here I have an exponential in the down. Now the four is not a problem, right? The four can be factored out. But the rule I know, the two, these two rules that I know with exponentials, uh, the exponential isn't in the denominator of a fraction. So what do you think? Suggestions. How can I rectify the issue I'm having here? You can, you can move up the E to the... Okay. How? So it would just be four times E to the three X power. Right, in which case I can move those four outside. And now this guy looks exactly like this rule. It's just that now I have a three instead of a K, but uh, it doesn't matter. So that's just going to be four over three E to the three X. That's your answer. And this is a, this is a very common problem here. Um, so if you're in a, computational problem and you just like have no idea how to proceed what that means is there's some rule that you don't have memorized um, that it th that it actually fits to a situation that I've told you before the fact that you don't see it means that there's a gap in your knowledge somewhere so it's a blind spot for you and as long as you don't know the rules that deal with that situation it's going to be a blind spot you're gonna be staring at it and you're like I don't I don't know what to do what kind of question is this okay so when it comes to computational problems knowing the rules important when it comes to the word problems, knowing the processes is important. So when it comes to reading a related rates problem, you should know the six steps, what should happen in the six steps, where things come, where you have to plug in, where you should be setting up an equation, when you should be drawing a diagram. You need to know how all these steps fill in together, right? Now, once you know the steps and you know the rules, like there is no problem that's going to confuse you. So if you are looking at a problem and you realize, I really don't know, I, I can't even take a guess as to what I'm supposed to do here. What that means you should do is go back to that topic in your notebook for that section. Every rule that I put in a box, read all of those because the answer is going to be there. So in, in this situation, the, the, uh, our salvation comes in the form of these two rules here. I see an integral sign and an exponential as I see here. My mind should immediately go to these two rules. And then my next goal is how can I get what I'm looking at to look like one of these rules? Sometimes you can just do a little algebra, just, oh, just make the power negative and move it up. Other times it might require like a substitution. So uh, a, a harder problem of this type would be something like, and I'm just going off the top of my head here. So something like uh, 3x over e to the x squared, right? So something like that would be a harder level problem. In which case you're like, uh, I don't have a rule for e to the x squared. I only have a rule for e to the x. So that's just one variable. So that would tell you, so do u equals e to the, so that would tell you, oh, just replace the x squared with one variable. 
So u equals x squared, your du would be 2x dx, and so your dx would be du over 2x, and then you go and you plug that in. So this is 3x over e to the u times du over 2x. Your x's would cancel. You can um, move the three halves out, and you have 1 over e to the u du. At that point, you remember, oh, I don't have a rule for e's in the denominator. So you move it up, make it a negative power. And then you apply the second rule. Your k is just negative 1 in this situation. So you just divide by negative 1 and leave the function alone. And so this is e to the minus x squared plus c. Okay. So at any given time, these rules should be your guide. You need to figure out, you need to first of all know what all these rules are. And anytime one of the guys in a rule that you know shows up, you just try to figure out a way to get him in the right position and for him to have the right form. So in our rules, the power did not have a square. So the first thing I did was take away the square from the power, just turn that square into a single variable. Um, why? Because it fits better with the rule. And then once that's done, I now see here, oh, that's in a denominator. Uh, I don't want it in a denominator. So making the power negative and bringing it up makes it fit the rule. So everything you're doing is just like, every step you make, you're just getting it to look like something else, to look like a situation that you already know how to deal with. So, so whenever you're, you're studying and you're in that situation, you come across a problem and it stumps you, well, is it a word problem or is it a computation problem? If it's a word problem, you need to go to the handout that I gave you, read the steps carefully because there's something you're missing in the steps. If it's a computational problem, the rules, the formulas that I give you that I put boxes around in class, that's where you need to go to to find the answer because chances are there's one of those box formulas that you're not um, uh, remembering. And so it's like a blind spot. You're, you're going to feel like, I have no idea. Like when you're drawing a blank, I have no idea how to even start this. What, what's happening at that point is you're, you're forgetting a formula or you're forgetting a sequence of steps because you should never really be in the situation where you don't know the next step. It's, it's one thing when you, you I kind of know I should head in this direction, but I can't get it to work out. That's a very different kind of problem. But if you find yourself just like completely drawing a blank, it means that there is a, 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 a specific data that you are not aware of. And it's going to be either a formula or a step in a sequence of steps for a word problem. So some general advice there. I mean, we did some specific problems here, but that's just some general advice for your studies. Um, so hopefully that whole discussion helped and hopefully now you kind of see how to deal with problems like that. And this also piggybacks on what we've been saying about LNs earlier, where um, sometimes it's nicer to apply an algebra rule or pre-calc rule before actually getting to the calculus, which is what we actually did here. We just use a law of exponents here. So we know that we can change the sign of a power and switch it from either the denominator to the numerator or vice versa. So knowing that I have that ability, I would do that first. And it might be something to try when, whenever you're confused. Just kind of try to use algebra to rewrite things. Maybe get it to look a little nicer. Maybe something will jump out at you then. OK. Uh, other, other questions? For the later section that's taking the exam next week, will you, um, are you planning on having another review session or like having the mock test live again? Or is this like the last time we're meeting? Um, I might have another one, I guess. Um, but I probably would just not open it until the day before again. So once this mock test closes, if you're taking it next week, I believe the next one is next week. Uh, May 12th is a Tuesday, right? 
So I'd probably open that back up on Sunday again. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, so and also yeah. in your email, so for the part two, which is the seven problems, that's like the finding the limits, related rates and whatnot. So you said that we only need to complete five, but you'll grade, you'll give credit for the best five problems. So like- Correct, we, so, so, so if you do everything, I will grade everything and give you the ones you got the most points on, but I'm not grading more than, no more than five would actually go towards it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, so ultimately your test comes in two sections. The first four are compulsory. So you have to do those. And then there are seven more that are given, but you do five out of those seven. You can skip any two you want. And if you do more than five, I'll give you credit for the best five complete problems done. And um, especially since you guys, I mean, with all these buffers I'm giving you for submission and uh, technical issues, timing really shouldn't be an issue. So, I mean, it's probably, if you're running out of time, um, it's probably a lack of practice. So you, you really wanna hammer that away tonight as much as possible. But be sure in any case to get a good night's sleep tonight. You do not want to be tired going into a math exam. It's, it's just not worth it. It's better that you learn less and get a good night's sleep than try to cram everything and end up in an exam with a tired brain for two hours. It, it, it doesn't work. So do all you can, do your best on the mock test, get the practice in. Um, it is enough time. In fact, your mock final, the mock final I gave you guys is actually the, fine, is the actual final I gave a previous class. And they had half an hour less than you guys had and they were able to do it. It was a fair time for the test. Um, so you shouldn't be running out of time. If you are, it's, it's probably a lack of practice issue. And I would say just do the best you can to hammer in the practice until about, I don't know, 10 p.m. tonight, the latest. But make sure you get a full hour, uh, eight, seven, eight, nine, whatever you are. Most people need at least seven. Get a full night's sleep and, um, Try to maybe even eat breakfast a little bit before. Um, probably not coffee though, because you know that will want make you want to go to the bathroom and things of that sort. But yeah, good night's sleep, have a hearty breakfast, probably off the coffee or other diuretics, and just uh, you should be fine if the mock uh, went reasonably well. Yeah, so um, we have about five or six, five minutes left. Uh, any uh, parting questions? I have a question on the Riemann sum problem yes. that was on the mock test. So mm -hmm. the delta x ends up being two. So when you draw your, like the number line. So hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me pull that up. That, that was problem eight, looks like. Yeah. Yes. So what was your question now? So when you draw the, the number line, you end yes. up doing every two numbers, right? Yes, because the first thing you do is you find your delta x, which is always b minus a over n. So in this case, it's b, which is 7 minus a minus 1 over n, which is 4. So you end up with 2. So you jump every 2. Minus 1 plus 2, 1 plus 2. Uh, three plus two, then five plus two. And then it says midpoint. So you want the guys in the middle. So you're actually going to pick the numbers zero, two, four, and six. And so your, your approximate for approximation for area is going to be roughly equal to delta x times 
uh, f of zero plus f of one, f of two plus f of four plus f of six. And then you just plug those into the, the for function. So your delta x is two times f of zero is 49 plus f of two is 49 minus two squared plus f of four is 49 minus four squared plus f of six is 49 minus uh, six squared. And it says it's okay to leave your answer as a sum. So that'd be the final answer there. And the exact answer using integration would just be to do uh, so for part B, the integral from minus one to seven of your function. Simplify that to whatever. So that would be that problem done. So you have to look out for whether it's about midpoints or left or right, and that will tell you once you find your delta x, draw the number line and cut it up in the right dissections. It tells you which numbers you'll want to pick in order to uh, uh, plug into the formula. Very windy. All right, so I guess we are going to wrap up. Uh, so I will uh, post a video recording of this thing with the PDF of what I just did and hopefully we'll be fine then. So uh, good luck tomorrow. And like I said, the mock final is going to be very similar to your final. So um, if you could get through that and I assume you got your question answered today, it will be fine for tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Get a good night's sleep, have something to eat and We'll stop there. So, so there are no quick part in questions. So I'll, I'll tell you guys bye. I'm gonna go. Bye. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. Take care. Good luck tomorrow, Thank guys. You. Take care.